Good morning, everyone. Hi, I'm John Crystal. I'm the chair of the Department of Psychiatry, and it's my tremendous pleasure to welcome you to the 2017 Flynn Lecture. Um, today, we're going to uh, uh, hear from uh, Professor Susumu Tanagawa from MIT, who's one of the most exciting and inspiring figures in the field of neuroscience. Um, I'm going to let his uh, postdoc, former postdoc, and now faculty member in our department, George Dragoy, introduce him in just a little bit. But I thought on this day, on this inaugural, inauguration day, <laughs> President Trump, it's useful to take a step back and think about the Flynn Lecture, because although the Flynn Lecture is named after John Flynn, uh, John Flynn's career was really a shared career in a way with his wife, Hulda Flynn. And I'd like to just tell you a few minutes about, about Hulda and John Flynn. So John and Hulda Flynn were both psychologists. Um, who, uh, John Flynn was a uh, uh, psychologist who studied the neurobiology and neurocircuitry of aggressive behavior and was a real pioneer in working out the circuit mechanisms through which a, a variety of forms of uh, complex behavior, of aggressive behavior, uh, was expressed using animal models. And Hulda Flynn became an organizational psychologist and was a social psychologist and was in the 30s and 40s very active in the New York Teachers Union and was a active supporter of the, uh, the Republicans in the Spanish Civil War. As a result of that, during the McCarthy hearings, she came under investigation by the House Un-American Affairs Committee and was uh, blacklisted. And uh, at that time, John Flynn was an experimental psychologist working at the Naval Medical Research Institute. Uh, and he was told that, uh, uh, that he could keep his job at the Naval Medical Research Institute, providing he divorced his wife. I'm sure he thought about it for a moment. <laughs> but he decided to uh, remain married to, uh, to Hulda, at which point both were blacklisted and neither of them could find work. In 1954, although uh, despite the political pressure to do otherwise, Yale University decided to hire John Flynn and there uh, at Yale, uh, he continued his work. So the story of Hulda and John Flynn is also the story of Yale University and its commitment to scientific freedom and its commitment to uh, uh, freedom of thought and uh, its uh, support for maintaining a diverse and inclusive community. And those are values that we nurture to this very day and are represented by this lecture. The second thing I would say about John Flynn in the Flynn Lecture is the notion, uh, the value that John brought as a leader of uh, the what's now called the Ribicoff Research Facilities at the Connecticut Mental Health Center. And that, and that value was that the complex behaviors, uh, that complex behavior, generally speaking, had a circuit, cellular, and molecular basis. And if that was true, that the neurobiology of psychiatric disorders could similarly be understood at those levels. And Many of you would say, well, what's so big about that? Isn't that what, what psychiatry does? Isn't that how psychiatrists think about, about the symptoms of psychiatric illness? And I would say that notion is really a radical departure from the way that psychiatry uh, considered pathophysiology uh, going back into the 40s and 50s. And it was really, again, uh, at Yale in many ways, that the notion of trying to understand the biology of the complex behaviors associated with psychiatric psychopathology 
uh, and the notion that these, this challenge of understanding the molecular cellular circuit biology and the clinical and therapeutic features of psychiatry, that these were one process. This is an idea uh, which has been, uh, uh, I wouldn't say discovered at Yale, but certainly an idea which uh, flowered at Yale, and, and Yale has for decades been a model for the rest of the world in terms of trying to think about how biology and behavior and psychopathology were linked. So for this reason, because this link between biology and behavior is so central uh, to our mission in the Department of Psychiatry, uh, and because um, uh, uh, John Flynn is such an important figure in representing that mission, those values um, in, 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 uh, at Yale, that the Flynn Lecture has emerged as probably if not the most important, one of the very most important lectures that we organize each year. So we're particularly honored to have uh, Professor Tanagawa speak today, and I'm going to introduce now George Dragoy to uh, tell us a little bit about him. Thank you, John. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce uh, Susumu Tanegawa, uh, <coughs> who is coming from MIT, where he is a Pickhauer Professor of Biology and Brain and Cognitive Sciences. He is also the director of Riken MIT uh, Neurocircuit Genetics, uh, which is also the Tanegawa Lab, and he is the director of Riken BSI uh, Institute. So Susumu. <coughs> has devoted his entire life, his entire career, to uh, research of scientific important questions. Uh, and I mentioned the word scientific because he started <coughs> with the <coughs> seminal discoveries in the field of immunology, or intersection between immunology and uh, genetics, um, summarized by, uh, <coughs> by his uh, Nobel lecture, uh, in which he describes uh, the uh, somatic generation of antibody diversity. Uh, this was a very uh, debated topic when he entered the field, and his research uh, gave strong support, basically <coughs> demonstrated the genetic basis for antibody diversity uh, as a selection process from a repertoire of pre-existing uh, antibody as opposed to process of the novel creation of an antibody response to, uh, to the exposure to an antigen. Uh, fast forward into the field of neuroscience uh, in which Susumu uh, dwelled with, with quite, quite a big courage in the uh, early 90s. Um, later on, Susumu and I actually found that the nervous system seems to obey pretty much the same principles by which representations are actually formed by a process of selection of neuronal sequences from an existing repertoire rather than being created de novo. So I found uh, my choice of being in his lab as a postdoc to be very fortunate um, as, as I, I was very inspired by his earlier work and his guidance uh, rather than um, choosing a more electrophysiology savvy uh, laboratory at the time. Uh, <clears throat> so, without taking too much time for the introduction, um, I would like to say that for the last five years or so, Susumu and Susumu's lab have perfected a uh, method for uh, which they call uh, Engram cell technology <coughs> for detecting and labeling and later manipulating at will a group of cells that are specifically activated in response to a particular experience. Uh, which they call engram cells. And I would, I would not disclose more about the work. I would let Susumu basically give uh, the entire story. Um, but this is fascinating times uh, in neuroscience. And it, it links back all the way to his years of in, in immunology and genetics. And uh, I perceive him as a, as a scientist of, of prime, a prime level. So the Nobel Committee awarded uh, the entire 
Nobel Prize of 1987 for medicine and physiology to Susumu. Um, and I'm very proud to introduce him and uh, I'll, uh, I'll let him present his work. Thank you. So this is the Flynn watch. Hmm. Oh. Since you're giving a talk, it's better to... Thank you. <laughs> to keep my time. To keep your time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's all on you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, George, uh, for wonderful introduction. Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm very honored about giving this uh, Flynn uh, Memorial Lectures. And I'm very pleased to be back to Yale. I think after more than 20 years, and the last time I would be here, I was an immunologist. And now uh, I'm an entirely new field. Um, another reason why I'm so pleased to come here is because as you, you just saw, George is on, a, uh, on the faculty here. And uh, he made a, a seminal uh, discovery when uh, he was uh, in my lab. <laughs> um, however, this project is really George's, okay? It was all done by him. Although my name is on the papers, 95% uh, is done by George. And when he moved to Yale from MIT, of course, project also moved. So our lab, since he left uh, three years ago, uh, we have now almost nothing on that subject. <laughs> so therefore, I'm not going to talk about uh, the, the, this uh, wonder, uh, very interesting phenomena of a preplay. Instead, um, I, will try to, I will try to focus on our lab's main uh, research which is to try to understand how we uh, form a memory, how we store memory information, and how we retrieve it, okay? And uh, this is, of course, the, one of the central problems um, so, uh, in, in neuroscience. So they're, they're, we are very uh, excited about uh, working in this field. Um, <coughs> so, uh, the beginning of uh, 20th century, okay, 1904, this man, the German zoologist uh, Richard Zeman, uh, <coughs> proposed what is called Engram theory of memory storage. However, this idea uh, was completely ignored by the uh, leading scientists uh, throughout the world until 1970 when uh, Daniel Schechter uh, restored it, publishing this book, explaining the value of this uh, Zeeman Engram theory. Um, incorporating the various uh, findings made since then, the Zeeman theory of uh, Engram, uh, memory engram, engram cells, particularly uh, focusing on what we call episodic memory, memory of what happens to you, can be stated like this. So certain population of neurons, which would be called the engram cells, encode information extracted from an episode by number one, by being activated, uh, by, the, by, by learning, and number two, undergoing enduring physical and or chemical changes, which is referred to as engram. And the subsequently, number three, reactivation of these cells by stimuli that are part of the original set of encoded stimuli uh, results in what we call recall of the original memory. So there are th at least three important criteria have to be met if you want to call a certain set of cells, uh, engram cells, and uh, these cells carry 
specific memory information. However, this has been very difficult to uh, demonstrate rigorously the, because of the lack of sufficient technology. So various people, immuno, uh, neuroscientists, uh, sort of uh, propose the criteria by which if somebody is going to claim a certain set of cells they have with the engram cell, then the for something like this with Martin and Morris uh, wrote in uh, one of the reviews, has to be met. And uh, they say the final test of any hypothesis concerning memory engram must be a mimicry experiment in which apparent memory is generated and expressed artificially without usual requirement for sensory experience. So in one sense, such an experiment would constitute a practical demonstration of the fact that we really do understand how memory works. In the same way that successful engineering feats uh, validate our hypothesis about the nature of the physical world. Okay. So, uh, I think in the five, six years ago, two or ten, uh, two of my people, um, Shu uh, Lu and uh, Steve Ramire, uh, decided to give a crack at this. Okay, and using this uh, advent of new technology, combining technology of optogenetics and uh, <coughs> transgenic uh, mice. Uh, virus mediated gene manipulation and so on. And uh, they used uh, this uh, behavior paradigm, memory paradigm called contextual fear conditioning. So animal is shocked in a particular context and they form the memory of that context is specifically a dangerous place. Now, the, the, this is the, their paradigm. Okay, to try to find the engram cells. So in this experiment, the virus that is, do I have a pointer here? It doesn't look like, um, the virus um, which expressed the channel rhodopsin uh, EYFP and also optic fiber are targeted into a part of hippocampus called dentate gyrus, okay? And uh, of the mouse, which is a transgenic mouse, in which immediate early gene C4 promoter will drive expression of uh, something called the TTA, which is a transcription factor uh, sensitive to the presence or absence of doxycycline. And, uh, what they, what they did is that they grow this animal uh, with a doxycycline in such a way that TTA will not be expressed and therefore channel rhodopsin will not be expressed in particular context. And then on the day of experiment, they switch the diet from uh, doxycycline positive to negative and then the subject animal to context dependent fear conditioning Using another context. Thank you very much. Uh, this one? Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. So, this is the uh, experimental day, and uh, you can see here in the context is changed to another, another one compared to the earlier one. And then uh, training is given, and the next day you put the animal back to the original context. Uh, in which uh, shock was not given, okay? So animal are supposed to not, to not to freeze. However, if you, uh, uh, this slide shows that the uh, population, subpopulation of the dendrogyrus cells, engram, uh, the, the gyrus, uh, granular cells are labeled with a channel rhodopsin. It's about uh, uh, 
about 5% of the cell get activated by, uh, by shock training. And then if you put a mouse uh, back to the context B in which animal was not uh, shocked, of course they don't freeze because this paradigm is context specific. But if you, t if you give the blue light to activate the channel rhodopsin labeled the cell in the dentate gyrus, then you get the robust freezing. In other words, you make animal to recall the memory without uh, giving the natural recall cues. And if you turn off the light, they stop freezing, and turn off the light, and turn on the light again, then uh, they freeze. So it's uh, reversible. Okay, so this data, uh, which is now the classic, uh, demonstrated that the population of cells activated uh, in the hippocampus by training, and then uh, later, if you uh, reactivate those cells, then a recall, memory recall, as expressed by specific freezing behavior uh, can be induced. So two of the three uh, criteria for calling these cells as memory engram cells seems to have been met. Now, I, want, I just want to show you that uh, how the mouse uh, behave uh, uh, in this uh, type of uh, uh, paradigm. So here is the first part, this is before shock. And uh, right is off right now, so the animal is moving around. <coughs> now right is on, you can see the flicking that light, and the animal ignores it. Uh, in, in this case, because the animal had not been shocked yet. And here comes the second part, real experimental part, post-training, and uh, light is off, therefore animal are not recording the fear memory. Now light is on, so animal stop moving, recording, uh, <coughs> recording this terrible experience they had, okay? Now, since this uh, early work in 2012 of Shu and uh, Steve, uh, many laboratories, including ours, have identified <coughs> similar kind of cell population in a different part of the brain, including a different subfield of hippocampus, uh, amygdala, some cortical areas, depending on which kind of learning memory paradigm uh, you use, okay? Now, for the uh, context-dependent fear condition, which I've been describing. In fact, it turned out memory engram cells are not localized in one particular area of the brain, but there are the series of brain areas uh, in which the, this type of engram cells are formed, which include the gyrus, CA3, CA1, and the further downstream of uh, amygdala. So there is a concept of engram cell packet. Now these are the engram cells which are connected uh, in a specific manner. Now, more recent study, very recent study, actually, uh, Teru uh, Okuyama uh, <coughs> demonstrated another kind of engram cell in the hippocampus, and this is a ventral part of CA1. In the, the uh, contextual engram formed in uh, CA1 that I've been describing is a dorsal part. This is very well established by many studies. Well, the little was known about what the, the ventral part of CA1 might be doing, and it turned out the ventral part of CA1, with a little surprise, is specifically designated to uh, store the memory of another uh, subject of the usually with the same species, like Jennifer Aniston cell uh, in human, okay? But this demonstration was done uh, with, the, with the mouse system. Now, what about enduring changes in the engram cell that hold the memory information, okay? These cells are activated and reactivated, but what about, do they really hold the, uh, the specific uh, information of the episode. 
So Ryan, uh, Thomas Ryan, Diraj Roy, and Michele Pinatelli collaborated on this. Uh, Anwar went through this, uh, again, the context dependent fear conditioning, and the engrams in dented gyrus were labeled with a uh, channel rhodopsin, as well as Michele. And then also an upstream of uh, dented gyrus where entrorhinal cortex superficial layer uh, project the uh, perforant pass uh, into the CA1, uh, the, the gyrus areas, uh, and also labeled uh, with uh, G GFP. So it shows up uh, green. This is the perforant pass. And here the dented gyrus cells, and one of them is engram cell, and nearby there are cells which are not labeled. Uh, by this uh, GFP uh, technology, by, by this technology. So here are the engram cell, and uh, this is non engram cell. And you can subject uh, slice made ex vivo from this mouth in the hip of, of the hippocampus uh, to uh, patch cramping uh, recording and look at the strength of the synapses. This is the one day after training. So it's a if there is any changes, that's the enduring changes. And as you can see here, uh, engram cell uh, synapses are specifically augmented in terms of strength compared to non-engram cell. Similarly, if you look at uh, the spine density of engram cell versus non-engram cell, the engram cell has clearly uh, augmented number of spine, spine density. Furthermore, they showed that by labeling uh, dented gyrus engram and also downstream CA3 engram cells, they show that if you optogenetically stimulate upstream dented gyrus engram cells and look at the response of downstream CA3 engram cells, there is a specific connectivity, preferential connectivity between the engram cell upstream to downstream compared to non-engram CA3 cell. So there the connectivity is maintained, specific connectivity between the two set of engram set cells are maintained at least one day after training. So conclusion up to this point goes like this. The dentary gyrus granular cell population identified by c force channel adoption labeling technology fulfill the multiple criteria for memory engram cells. They are activated by learning. They show learning-induced enduring changes. They are sufficient for the recall of the specific memory upon reactivation. And other people, Denny, Denny's lab, for instance, in Colombia, they showed actually these cells are also necessary for the recall of that specific uh, con context memory, fear memory. Furthermore, uh, we, have, uh, we can conclude for each memory, multiple engram cell populations uh, distributed in multiple brain area uh, form an engram cell specific pathway. Preferential connectivity between upstream and the downstream engram cell ensembles along the pathway may be the crucial substrate for memory retention. Now, I would like to switch a gear and uh, talk about um, <coughs> our uh, study on engineering memory engram cell. This ability, te technical ability to identify specific engram cell population allowed us to manipulate those cells and to see the effect of that manipulation for the animal's cognition and the behavior in a healthy animal as well as diseased animal. The first thing I want to talk about is this, what, what is called creation of a false memory. Now, it is known in a human uh, memory 
uh, it, it sometimes very disruptive and illusionary. In other words, they make incredible claim of uh, uh, having a memory that they could not have had. Okay, and uh, this is actually uh, is the problem in uh, social and legal settings. For instance, one large survey carried out years ago uh, <coughs> showed that three quarter of inmates convicted primarily due to eyewitness testimony turned out to be innocent. And that doesn't mean they are, they, 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 that doesn't mean that uh, the, the, the problem of uh, the memory or, or the case, but it's a high proportion of people are uh, uh, convicted uh, on the basis of the memory of some uh, <coughs> victims or uh, some other people, okay? So now, in human, the, this uh, false memory phenomena has been known quite a quite long time and uh, it's not very clear exactly how this happened. But most of the case, uh, experts in the field think that this is a misincorporation of external information uh, to a particular um, episode, okay? Now, my people, Shu and uh, uh, Steve, uh, first of all, wanted to see whether one can induce false memory in mouse, because there are no system like that before. It was not clear where animal can form what we call false memory that observed in humans. But also they wanted to find out another way false memory could be formed. That is, uh, if you let, mouse, if you force animal uh, to recall some episode of the past, okay? And then at the same time again, there are some uh, stimuli of uh, very strong valence, positive or negative, can they associate those uh, two informations uh, to form a memory? And uh, this is the paradigm they used. So mouse is kept uh, on the left side. The mouse uh, uh, is put in a box. Okay, it said blue, but uh, it's actually not a blue, but it doesn't matter, in a particular box. And then uh, no shock is given, but the mouse will explore there, and they form the memory of that box, specific feature of the box, okay? And we can label those engram cells with a channel rod option. And the next day, you move the mouse to another box, different box, and then uh, give the blue light uh, to let his memory of box A uh, retrieved. At the same time, gave a uh, foot shock, okay? So question is, do, would they associate the box A memory uh, with the foot shock, despite the fact that they were never shocked in box A? And this can be tested on the third day by seeing whether animal will get frozen in a box A. The answer is yes, as shown in this uh, set of data. So there is a robust association of recalled uh, memory uh, with a new uh, stimulation, shock in this case. And this is a context specific because if you put animal in uh, another context, context C, there's no, uh, no memory is formed. Okay, now I would like to move to uh, another uh, engineering uh, experiment. And this is a switching memory valence. Now, if you think about it, when you form a memory of something happened to you, at least there are two kinds of information uh, get into the memory. One is a sort of a neutral context memory, you know, that situation that you are in, which comes with no uh, valence, no emotional component. 
and this turned out to be encoded in the hippocampal circuits. The hippocampal memory does not encode the emotion. The emotion is in part, or emotional part of the episode is encoded and stored in downstream amygdala, patholateral amygdala, okay? So now, if we, so this is the work of uh, Roger Redondo and uh, uh, the Josh Kim. So you will put the mouse uh, in, in a box and the mouse will uh, form the context memory. And then you give a shock. This is the fear context dependent fear conditioning. Then what happens is that uh, in the downstream of amygdala, uh, the type of cells which uh, presumably respond to uh, fearful stimuli uh, uh, will be connection with the contextual uh, engram in the hippocampus will connection will be strengthened, okay? And then uh, presumably there is another type of cell, which is a pressure responding cell, connection will not be strengthened. So therefore, you get a passive behavior, like a freezing. Now, if you take that mouse, and then uh, in the same context, uh, you give, uh, you, you give a reward uh, stimuli. Then what happened is the behavior will switch from a passive behavior to appetitive behavior. But not only that, it turns out original fear memory uh, is reduced. So this suggests there is a competition uh, between the circuits, which is holding uh, the passive uh, memory and appetitive memory. So Josh wanted really uh, investigate into this very interesting phenomena about uh, uh, balance of uh, emotions uh, in the stored memory. So he uh, did a heroic experiment of trying to identify genetic markers for the presumed uh, reward cells and uh, fear responding cell in BLA, basolateral amygdala. And I will not go into the detail of this procedure because it takes a long time to explain to you. But in any case, uh, he came up with a marker uh, for fear responding cell, uh, fearful event responding cell, and uh, pleasurable event responding cell. And these cells, uh, turn, uh, genes were already known, but it was not uh, understood as the uh, marker for uh, this type of cell in uh, amygdala. And what is shown here, RSPO2 cells is uh, labeled with a uh, green uh, color. And uh, they, these cells are in the anterior part of BLA mostly, as you can see here, okay? And then uh, on the other hand, the, the PPP cells, uh, which, uh, which uh, mark the reward cell in BLA are uh, in the posterior part. They seem to be segregated, okay? And not only that, uh, it turned out when you look at the, uh, with the physiology, the effect of activating one type of cell to the other type of cell and mutually, it turned out that they antagonize each other in BLA uh, through what is called feed forward inhibition, as indicated uh, by the, this cartoon. Okay? So this explains why the memory uh, for the positive and negative valence uh, will compete with each other. Um, now, uh, I want to, I'm switching uh, the, this uh, topic again. And now the question is, can this competition be used in order to uh, manipulate the animal state of emotion? And as you know, this audience probably know much better than I do, uh, depression is a terrible disorder 
of the brain. And uh, emotion is very much uh, relevant uh, for this uh, problem. And the uh, question is, can you attenuate depression-like behavior by manipulating reward or pleasure uh, engram cell? Okay. So that's the question uh, that uh, Steve and uh, Shu addressed. So question is again, can one exploit the competition between positive and negative memories to attenuate stress-induced depression-related behaviors, such as number one, in the rodent system, the loss of willing willingness to cope with a challenging situation, which is testable by what is called the tail suspension test. You hang the mouse with a tail, and a normal mouse will try to uh, climb up uh, <coughs> rather than just hanging there. But the depressed animal, depressed mouse, will give up much more uh, easily. And the second is the inability to experience or seek out pleasure, anhedonia, which is testable by sucrose water preference test. And in fact, uh, when uh, Steve and uh, Shu uh, <coughs> stress, gave a chronic stress to mice, okay, and uh, tested their behavior, uh, in both of these tests for rodents, uh, one is a tail suspension test and the other is a sucrose preference test. There were the clearly these animals exhibited the, uh, <coughs> these phenotypes, behavioral pheno abnormal phenotype. However, when male mice are allowed to play with the female mice for a few hours, before chronic stress uh, is applied to him, and then look at, uh, look at the behavioral uh, feature of this animal in these two different kind of uh, test of uh, uh, depression uh, phenotype with activation, optogenetic activation of engram cells, animal formed uh, uh, while uh, the male mice were playing with the female mice, which is a positive valence uh, engram cells. If you do that with a light specific manner, as you can see here, they, they, they hung up, uh, they, they will, will climb up uh, uh, like a normal animal. And if you look at the sucrose preference, uh, they show the, the more or less normal phenotype. Okay? So it looks like we could uh, ameliorate the mouse depression-like behavior by manipulating uh, positive engram cells in these animals. Now, one can map, actually, the positive engram ensemble pathway for this depression rescue by using uh, by, com by co combination of, of uh, uh, expressing HT, which works uh, the, for, for inhibiting activation of cells, versus channel rhodopsin, which uh, promote activation. Okay? And uh, so we labeled the animal uh, in the channel uh, the dentate gyrus engram with uh, channel rhodopsin. But uh, downstream in the BLA, we label them uh, engram cells with HT. For, and this we do it, we can do it in the cell body activation or terminal, target terminal activation. So you do combine these two, and uh, you can see here, this way one can map the uh, crucial, crucial uh, engram cells, which are necessary for the purpose of the uh, depression rescue. And we came up with the, uh, the map like this. So engram cell ensemble pathway for a pleasure episodic memory start with the hippocampus and then go to BLA, uh, 
PLA uh, in, uh, the po positive engram cells, and then go to the uh, nucleus of Kanban cell. Okay. Okay. Uh, finally, uh, I would like to uh, talk about the uh, possibility of uh, restoring memory in early Alzheimer's mouse model. So it's been known uh, by people who work on uh, Alzheimer patients and uh, animal model of Alzheimer's that uh, before the signature of advanced uh, Alzheimer's disease appear, that is like uh, A-beta plaques and uh, tau tangles and so on, before that appear, there is a period of a few months to a few years, depending on the species, where one cannot find all these uh, uh, cellular uh, signature of Alzheimer, and yet mouses of no, uh, mouse or people's their uh, memory uh, mnemonic me ability is impaired. Okay, and uh, many of these people who are working on Alzheimer, I understand, have thought that is because the, these patients and the animal are losing the ability uh, to form new memory. So my student, <coughs> Diraj, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> Diraj Roy decided to investigate more detail of what's happening during this early period of Alzheimer using mouse model of Alzheimer's. And this is the mice used uh, uh, generally available, uh, genetically uh, altered mice. Uh, this is a, a double transgenic animal, APP and free securing one uh, mutants mice. And also there is a third one, which is a transgenic mouse in which uh, uh, tau mutation uh, uh, is close to. Okay. Now, so here is the, some of the essence of the data that uh, Delage uh, found. So you take this mouse, and uh, seven, if it's seven months old, you can see that in very much plaques in the hippocampus, where the plaque first to appear, usually. And if you wait another two months, you can see all these uh, plaques here. Okay? And that's what one would have expected. Now, if you uh, subject this animal to uh, Again, usual uh, context-dependent fear conditioning. Okay. Uh, they seem to be able to form. This is a mutant. This is a control. And this is a freezing. Short-term memory seems to be normal. They can freeze. However, if you wait a day uh, where the so-called consolidation, cellular consolidation phase is uh, fi finished, and then uh, there is, you can see the deficit impairment uh, in the expression, expression of that memory, okay? So the, 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 from this, you can already say that memory seems to be formed. It's just that uh, they have a problem in consolidating and retrieving it. In fact, if you label those engram cells for this context-dependent fear conditioning with the channel of toxin, and in the next day, you uh, stimulate those cells with the blue light. Okay. Then you can see the full uh, expression of the, of the memory that is shown by freezing in an activation-dependent manner. But at the same time, in the next day, if you measure the freezing with a natural recall cue, just putting back into that context, uh, it can show the am animal is amnesiac, okay? So now, at the same time, also uh, Delage found that these engram cell, by looking at the spine of engram cell, as opposed to non-engram cell carefully, he found that the uh, spine, or specifically the engram cell, 
is abnormally reduced. So he wanted to see whether he can rescue the uh, <coughs> spine density of these engram cells of early Alzheimer mouse model. And for this, he used another optogenetic uh, trick uh, <coughs> in which there is a particular version of channel rhodopsin, which was invented by late Roger uh, Chen. Uh, in, in this case, these, these, when, when the cells are activated, uh, <coughs> that contains this particular type of uh, the uh, channel rhodopsin called OCHIF, OCHIF uh, these cells will fire at a very high rate, 100 hertz, as opposed to the usual uh, channel rhodopsin uh, expressing cells. Now, you know that 100 hertz stimulation is the ideal frequency of stimuli inducing LTP uh, in, in the synapses, and this has been known years. So he did that in vivo uh, <coughs> by uh, letting, uh, letting the chief channel rhodopsin expressed in upstream, uh, upstream uh, the uh, internal cortical superficial layer cells and to see whether what happens to the, uh, the spine density of uh, downstream dentate gyrus engram cells. And what he found is uh, re recovery of the uh, abnormally low density of sp uh, spines, in specifically in engram cells. And what is most exciting is, as the engram cell uh, <coughs> density is recovered by this treatment, so was the ability of mouse to express uh, this uh, context-dependent fear conditioning memory just by exposed to the natural recall cues. So basically, uh, one can recapitulate what I just said uh, like this. So in the early stage of AD, memory can be formed apparently, but the retrieval seems to fail. And this is because uh, the spine density or synapse, you can say synapse uh, density in memory engram cell is abnormally low, okay? However, optogenetics can restore the synapses density, syna synap synaptic density and the memory retrieval by natural recall cue uh, can be accomplished. Of course, I emphasize this is all mouse model studies, okay? It doesn't necessarily mean same thing can happen in a human patients, and I'll come back to that later. So in any case, um, um, I would like to summarize what I have talked about. So number one, memory holding cells what we call engram cells for specific memory have now been identified very clearly. A specific memory is retained in a preferential connectivity of multiple engram cell ensembles distributed in multiple brain areas. And depending on which type of memory you are looking at, of course, different part, different area of the brain participate in contributing <coughs> engram cell and the, their, their connectivity is also different depending on pre preferred connectivity is different depending on which memory, what kind of memory uh, you are looking at. Number three, artificial manipulations of engram cells allow an inception or creation of a false memory, a switch of memory valence, an attenuation of depression behavior, and the rescue of 
early Alzheimer, Alzheimer's models in mice. So these data are providing uh, implications for future development of novel synaptic methods based on direct manipulation of neural circuits, which may not entirely depend on uh, chemical drugs. And of course, there are many ways to go uh, before this kind of therapy will be invented. But uh, uh, engineers are very interested in this. And as you know, that uh, uh, if it doesn't matter, if it doesn't mind that uh, you know invasive technology, the Parkinson, Parkinson's, for instance, already a method of therapy like that is being applied with uh, some success. And the people are trying to uh, invent, invent low valency or even no, uh, no, no, uh, the, uh, the, the one with the, the method to stimulate or inhibit specific area of the brain, uh, with, uh, which is with a, a no or low uh, in, invasiveness. So we hope that uh, this study with the animal model it has been giving the, uh, pre uh, prin the principle, the, con the <coughs> so it may become useful in the future. Okay, so I think I'm finishing. Um, uh, I have already uh, referred to uh, uh, people's contribution from the lab. So maybe I don't need to do this, uh, uh, each, each one of them. I just want to emphasize, however, a few people's names were not mentioned uh, in my talk. Arvin Govindarayan actually is a, is a genius. He was a postdoc in my lab, student and a postdoc in my lab. And he is the one who started about this project of at least conceptually started their experiments for identifying uh, engram, memory engrams. Uh, Autumn Aaron is the best technician we have and she can do very demanding uh, fine uh, manipulation surgery of mouse brains. Uh, another person I didn't mention is uh, Takashi Kitamura. I, I, I showed only one slide about the social memory uh, over Teru Okuyama, uh, Okuyama, but uh, also Takashi Kitamura also contributed to this work. Now, that's all I want to say to you, but uh, before I uh, stop, I want to dedicate uh, this lecture and the work to Shuru, who started this work of identifying engram cells. And uh, unfortunately, just a uh, few weeks after, after he arrived for the new, uh, new place, you know, Northwestern University uh, as a PI, uh, he was deceased. So that was a tremendous loss. Uh, not only for people who know him, but I think in a field, he was a, such a wonderful, such an innovative scientist. And uh, uh, we are still lamenting about his loss. Okay, so that's all I want to give to you. Thank you.